Good afternoon, everybody. All right. Hey, well, um, thank you very much for coming out today. Really appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Henry Sell. I'm the CIO of Cloudera Government Solutions. And um, this, this talk really uh, matters a lot to me. Um, prior to coming uh, and joining Cloudera, I was part of Hortonworks. Before that, I was actually part of uh, the FBI. I was doing counterterrorism work. And uh, Accumulo was a, an incredibly important part of enabling the mission that I, that I, that I was on uh, on an everyday basis. And I was working very closely with uh, incredible engineers like John um, uh, to, to leverage Accumulo to uh, help achieve our mission. Uh, John, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, John Hycock, uh, Solutions Architect at Quadera. Yeah, and uh, that short introduction, he worked with me. He, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the man, the man of few words, um, he is uh, incredible, and, and we did a lot of great work together uh, in the FBI. Um, one of the things that you're going to walk out of today is, is you're going to see the uh, Durlist example um, and, and see how it's implemented uh, on top of Accumulo. Um, you should walk away with a, a basic understanding around uh, this example for the supporting uh, table designs. Uh, you'll see a simple uh, text search supporting a single wildcard. Um, and you'll see how the Durlist elements work together to accomplish uh, the feature set that we're going to be showing. Um, you should also hopefully walk away with some justification uh, for sometimes keeping the SQL out of NoSQL. So, uh, you know, trying to think about this from a foundational perspective, changing the paradigm. Um, a, a lot of a lot of people that uh, start approaching and uh, the, the use case around NoSQL, uh, they they oftentimes want to leverage uh, NoSQL because they've heard of some of the benefits, but they often don't understand um, why the why the solution can be good for their use cases, or even how to take advantage. Um, of that kind of back end. Um, and, and so one of the things that was really helpful for me in the beginning was uh, translating, because everybody understands RDBMS, you understand a database uh, and how it works, but how does it actually uh, translate to a store like this? And so um, one of the things that, I'm just gonna hop down here, the, that, that was helpful for me is like taking a, taking a database and breaking out how does this actually uh, uh, get translated into a store here. And as you can see, uh, we've got a record in a database uh, ingesting that into Accumulo. It gets stored as, uh, as single cells. So you have a row ID, which would be like, the row ID for your particular record. Uh, you have a column, which is essentially a, uh, you a label for the particular columns within your record, uh, a timestamp based on the, usually based on the, the ingest, uh, the, the time at the ingest. Um, and then the value is actually what was the, the, the value in the cell uh, on that particular column. Um, and so that, that translation for me was uh, helpful in just saying, okay, like, how do I shift my, my, my thinking um, and, and start thinking in a NoSQL uh, way? And how do you think about how do you access this data? And, and how do you access a set of material that, that you're looking for? Um, and so that was really helpful. Another helpful thing was that since, uh, since Accumulo uh, 1, there has been uh, a set of examples that were shipped with Accumulo um, that were very helpful to, uh, to view over the years and, and leverage to, to get a better understanding uh, of Accumulo. Uh, in Accumulo 2, this actually broken out into its own repo. One of the most, um, uh, one of the ones that I, I actually really like and was helpful for uh, my, my understanding of Accumulo uh, is the Durlist example. And when you combine it with the file data example, it really allows you to, um, allows for the emulation of various file system characteristics. So background to understand uh, this example. When you think of a file system, uh, you could have many small files. Um, and if, if you have, very, uh, if you have uh, a lot of small files and you're trying to store that onto HDFS, you have the potential of having um, a, a small file abuse problem um, where the name node is, is restricted based on um, the limits of the heap size on the name node. Uh, whereas uh, Accumulo is designed to manage lots of small things extremely well, uh, and that from a scalability perspective since 2014, 
uh, Accumulo has been able to span name nodes. So it's highly scalable uh, and allows you to get prepared for uh, the, the example that you're about to see. Uh, I'm gonna pass it over to John, and John's gonna give you uh, some background on one, Accumulo, and a little bit about the, the, the key structure, the basic setup for, uh, for this example, and um, walk you through the example itself. Hi, so um, the Cumulo sorted, distributed, key value store. Um, the sorting is important when you look at the key structure. A lot of you have probably seen this a million times. Um, generally, when you're designing your tables, you want to have the thing you're looking for sorted so that uh, from left to right, the, the thing that you're looking for is furthest to the left. The, the further right you go, the more keys you have to look into in order to actually get the data that you care about. So uh, complex key, simple value, um, row ID, where you want to find your thing in most cases. That's, that's the important bit for how you're storing your information, uh, how you're retrieving your information, sorry. Um, the family, um, important if you're trying to uh, label your data. If you're trying to shift Accumulo to be more common oriented, then maybe you use locality groups. Um, maybe you mix and match, um, but simple key elements for that. Uh, qualifier, additional information on top of uh, what you would like to describe for your values. Um, visibility, um, from the beginning, Accumulo has done a pretty good job of uh, implementing the cell level security. Um, basically, this is a Boolean expression that you must pass in order to access the cell. Um, in Accumulo, you can see it's part of the key. I think in HBase, it's like a prefix to the value or something like that. Yeah, Josh is nodding. Um, so when you submit a scan, you tell it what authorizations you would like to use for that scan. So it doesn't have to be the superset of all your authorizations, so like in an RBAC type model. Um, if you have a privilege, that's what you're executing with for that particular account. Um, in this kind of model, you can pick and choose. So maybe important if you have uh, a lot of privileges and you're trying to export data from your store in order to give to somebody who has fewer privileges. So an interesting thing you can do in that, kind of side, in that sort of scenario. Um, Timestamp, generally people that are writing data to the tables don't mess with that, but it, it, you can do some interesting things if you um, know what you're doing. Um, and value is the, just the value. So, um, for this particular example, uh, I use the 1.9 examples from Accumulo. Um, so it's like part of the source tree. You mentioned that the examples kind of got ripped out in uh, later versions to its own GitHub repo. Um, and I'm running on 1.9 Accumulo. Uh, I've set up a mini Accumulo cluster on my, just this, well not this laptop, but that laptop. Uh, <coughs> gives you a pretty quick implementation of a way to functionally interact with an Accumulo instance without having to set up a bunch of different things. There are many different ways to set up a simple example. Um, I think like uh, Unos and Muchos, two examples, and there's a bunch of Docker containers that are on Docker Hub as well, if that's your thing. Um, so that was how I configured, or that was how I just got the Accumulo instance up and available. Um, for the setup, I'm not sure if this is readable, but okay, so it's readable, great. Um, I just made a couple directories. We will challenge you later that some of it won't be readable. Yeah, one has iChart, but um, uh, in, this <laughs> in this one, it's just showing the list of steps to set up the, the, the simple directory structure that I ingest as part of the example. So um, opt, files, prod, and test. Uh, some simple text that goes into a couple different files. Um, note that code is a little bit longer than done. I'm going to, so chunking is a component of this, which I'll go over later, but that one is long enough to surpass the chunk limit. Um, duplicate, um, duplicate file contents for done in both test and prod. Uh, a hidden file, I touched an empty file and uh, added execute permissions. You can imagine I did these because they're characteristics that end up in the table. So this is just uh, an LS on those uh, directories so that you can see. Um, done is, I'm gonna sort of like walk the path of how that file traverses different tables and how you can glean information from it as part of this example. So there'll be a lot of red boxes around things pertaining to done. Um, and yeah, you can, you can see that 
that particular instance of it has the executable attribute. Um, also hashing, very important. Uh, MD5 is the, the, the default hash that's used for this particular implementation. Um, this is helpful for some deduplication that will occur later, uniquely identifying things. It's the, actually the, the row in the file table, and uh, the data table, sorry, where the file content ends up. Uh, I just wanted to provide this for reference. Um, I don't expect you to memorize the MD5s, but um, note that they're there. There'll be a test. So um, I mentioned that I ran the 1.9, but I ripped some of the like the helper scripts from the 2.0 stuff that run X. I think um, it prefixes the the class so that you only have to call out durlist.ingest, and I think it includes some dependencies automatically. Um, the, the arguments are just, you know, the instance name of Accumulo, the user, uh, the Zookeeper instance to connect to. Um, if you can see at, at the top there, there's that dash viz prod. Uh, that's the authorization label that's going to be applied to the files that are in the prod directory. Um, we'll go over where that's important later. Uh, and then the chunk size of 27, um, that you'll see that in the directory structure as well and how it affects the files that got put in, but uh, that will slice things based on uh, that byte limit. Does everybody see the area that he's talking to? This, this first command here, you know, the visibility, prod, uh, it's all running. Yeah. Those may have needed highlighting for ease of visibility. Um, and you can see the, the different directories that, that got pulled in. So it, it just recurses through whatever that base directory that you specify looking for files and directories. And so in this instance, it specified opt files prod. Uh, the next one does opt files test, same thing, uh, different visibility label. Again. You'll, you'll see where that can be interesting for some of the later tables. Um, so when you run the index example, um, you can see that it creates three tables, data table, dir table, and index table. The other one's prefixed with the cumulo dot, uh, not, not made as part of this example. <laughs> um, uh, data table for storing the files, dir for the directories and tree structure, index for the, the terms that are available for searching. And then also I set auths for the root user, which is the only user that I've been using for this particular example, so that he can actually scan with those privileges. Uh, so here's the eye chart. Um, I, I don't know if this is actually readable, but that's not necessarily important. I just wanted to make it available on the slide. Um, there is a, a row element for each node in the file tree. Um, it's containing different characteristics of the file system, like whether it's executable, um, files have their MD5 for lookup. Um, hidden is marked there, but in Linux, that's not necessarily super interesting. Um, and then also the length. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through how done shows up in here. So if you can note, if you can read this, um, uh, and if you look at the Kirby lines, that was actually 50% uh, of the presentation duration took. Yeah. So that, la that yeah. last screen, <laughs> Yeah, that last screen, this is just a portion of it that is related to the done file. Um, that, that's it, it, in Accumulo. And, uh, and, and, and then, go ahead. <laughs> um, so you, you can see that that particular LS that shows the executable bit uh, marked as uh, exec true. Um, uh, the MD5 matches and the file length as well and the, the timestamp. Uh, so we're just we're going to try and show again how how done makes it through the example. Uh, so in the data table, you have the actual file contents. So the the red box here represents the the entries for the file hash that is computed for done. Um, and if you remember, that particular file has the same content in two different directories. Um, and we'll we'll walk through the different. Um, characteristics of, of the key. So you see the hash there, they all have the same hashed entry because the content is the same, the MD5 would be the same for each of these. Um, the, the column, uh, sorry, the column family uh, has the refs for, the, for the, the first two records here in the box, representing in this particular example just the name. Um, in other examples, it might have a file extension. This one doesn't actually have one, so it's just looking for the, the trailing dot and then rip that out as an extension but you can do whatever metadata for that bit. Um, uh, and then the chunk for uh, how the content is actually stored in the table. Um, for refs entries, that uh, the column qualifier, the so before that null byte separator, the slash x 00, 
is a hash of the, the name used for this file, the bytes of the name, and then null byte separator with the actual value. Any, um, any refs entry will have that hash in there for correlating it to uh, uh, bits for a particular named entry from the, the file system that got extracted. Um, in the chunk, uh, you see the, uh, the eight bytes there. The first four are the chunk size. Uh, so uh, <laughs> you see hex 1b, it's, it's 27, I promise. Um, uh, the next four are uh, which, inst which chunk instance it is. And then the, the, the very last entry on the, the page is that you know, there's an end of chunk marker, essentially. It's, it's the, the, the end of the file. Um, there was one chunk. Um, so here's, here's where some iterator comes in a little bit. So you'll notice that the, the visibility for uh, the prod done and test done matches what you would expect based on the way it was ingested. Um, but you see that it's combined into an ORD Boolean expression on the bottom. And you also can notice that there's only one instance of the content because there's an iterator running on the table, the chunking combiner, which combines the visibilities as well as deduplicates the chunks at the same time. So because they have the same chunk size and the same hash, um, that combiner uh, combines the Boolean expression to uh, something that would be legitimate for somebody who's accessing it based on the existing visibilities. So um, I can, I'll talk about iterator a little bit later, but um, you see and in the value you have the names for those files, which in the first two records end up uh, being part of the hash, which is the prefix and the column qualifier and then the actual content in this example, I'm ready for prime time with the new line, and then the empty chunk end of content marker. Um, to note, so I mentioned that there was one that actually did get chunked, and so all of those same characteristics of the chunk records apply here, and you can see that it gets sliced off at the P for prime time. And uh, if you look at the last four bytes of the eight byte uh, chunk column qual, uh, qualifier, you have uh, you know, the zeroth, the oneth, and then the tooth. Um, and so I mentioned the iterator running on the table. So when the ingest class that I called uh, as at the very beginning of the example uh, executes, it looks to see if the tables exist. If they don't, then it will create them. And for the data table, it uh, sets the chunk combiner, which is in the accumulo examples, so if you are actually doing this uh, for yourself, you want to make sure that's in the, the class path for your mini accumulo instance, because that may not be the same directory you expect it to be. <laughs> um, and then your scans on the data table won't work. Um, and then, oh yeah. Um, so the versioning iterator uh, is by default going to be configured for all the tables that's So the index table, uh, no value is actually stored here. Um, if you can see in the row, there's an F prefix and an R prefix for all of the entries. Uh, the F, the forward instance of the particular term that you might be looking for, it splits every, uh, I believe every directory or file name. And so no slashes are part of this search, but you can, you know, for any, you know, for opt files, prod or code or done or test, that, that will have an entry there. Um, it stores it in forward and reverse. Uh, in the column family, you have I not necessarily interesting. In the column qualifier, you have the actual um, row from the dir table. So if you successfully find the records that you're looking for, you have the exact row match that you would want to get to in the directory table for the thing that you found. So standard indexing things, you, you want to have the thing that you're looking for, sort it to the left. So in this, like for done, that was actually literally the furthest right thing in the name. And now since it's something that you might be looking for, it's in the row. Um, it's also reversed and we'll show you why <laughs> in a second, why that would be important. But, um, and, and I'll actually go back for this, but so here is the, uh, the query utility that comes with the Durlist example. Uh, it supports um, leading, middle, and trailing wildcards. Uh, so in this first example, we search for asterisk O-N-E. So if we look back here, um, if you were to look for 
if you only had forward and you were to look for all records that ended with O-N-E, you would like you'd scan your whole table. Um, if you store it in reverse, then you can begin at uh, E-N-O and then stop when you no longer have something that matches that sort and you have a much smaller subset of the things that you're looking for. That's a lot better. <laughs> Basically, um, so again, you're so even in that in, within that one word, the thing that you're looking for, you're sorting further to the left, the e, the n, and the zero or the o. Important things if you're trying to uh, quickly look up stuff. And so there's subsequent examples here. Uh, the the middle one uh, picks a side based on the length. I think I this was a a bad example. I should have left the the o in there, but. Um, uh, the, the second one will search for things that start with D based on having a middle wildcard. Um, the third one is D star. It basically does the same query as the one before it. Um, and then I do an exact term search with code. So no wildcards whatsoever. It's actually just ripping out whatever entries have that particular element. And so as a result, you get, for whatever you're looking for, whatever result set comes back, you have the exact row match from the dir table. And so if it happens to be a file, you can then grab the MD5. And with the MD5, you can look up the exact hash in the data table to get your content. So these, these three tables working together to, um, if you're doing a term search, get to a directory location to get to the file content. So do it in the most performant manner to, from one to another. Um, another interesting thing, I, I don't actually have a specific use case for this, but uh, because of the way the directory table is structured with the, uh, the leading depth of the particular element that you have, you can pick an arbitrary depth to begin your search. You can go from like things that are three levels deep to things that are five levels deep. I, I don't, again, I don't know. <laughs> I can't think of a, an, an easy use case for that right off the top of my head, but it's just something that comes out of the way you've designed the tables uh, because that can be awkward depending upon your implementation of whatever it is that you're trying to store and make it easily available. Um, file count, also part of this, um, and you'll also note that um, when I execute the file count, I don't specify the, uh, the visibility that should be applied. So uh, if you look in that red box, it's got two empty brackets. Uh, that will manifest later when I'm displaying this in the, the GUI. Um, uh, but basically, this for each for each element in the dir table, this will compute the uh, the directories at that level, uh, the the files, and then the recursive directories and recursive files. And so you see for opt files as it's highlighted, it's uh, you know two directories under files, zero files. Uh, two recursive directories, and then five recursive file count. Um, that gets written back to the table, as you can see in that entry. And it's written with the visibilities that you specify if you specify them, which I did not. So um, an interesting thing would be to actually have an application that sits on top of it. And so as part of the example, uh, there's, I think, a swing app that uh, uses the, the directory and the data table to display the file hierarchy and the content of the files. Um, this, the, the first few slides will be with submitting both uh, the prod and test authorizations. And uh, you can see the, you know, the, the metadata elements in the upper right, the tree in the left, and then the bottom right frame, you'll see the file content. So here's done. <laughs> Um, you see the you know, long minus timestamp and then the, the uh, metadata characteristics in the upper right. You can see the tree expanded out for the different things of that tier. Um, obviously, you would have to, you, you would need to have some sort of uh, <laughs> protection against very long uh, uh, tree elements. But um, in this simple example, it's super easy. But, um, uh, so that displays, I'm ready for prime time. That, that content, there's even a new line separator if it were rendered conveniently on the screen. Um, I wanted to show that code, you actually get the, 
the contents stitched back together, since that would be an important part of uh, breaking it apart if you cared about it ever again. And then um, for this example, I, I, I felt obligated to show how the visibility manifests in an application that might be using a table like this, or table structures like this, uh, as a back end. So you'll notice that uh, in this first screen, um, only prod authorization was specified when the viewer was started. So um, other than the uh, file count node that you see there <laughs> that has no visibility, uh, or has, has no authorization label applied to it, um, you only see prod with the prod authorization. Same for test in the second one. And then the third one, there is no authorization specified whatsoever, so you don't see anything. The app still runs. Um, an interesting thing about the designs when you consider backing with Cumulo or something like it would be that the sparsely populated tables, you should develop your apps to expect that things might not be there based on your visibility, your accesses, just uh, whether or not it was important for that particular element to contain those characteristics. You don't have to have something in there independent of whether it was there for another record. Um, uh, so a lot of these things don't don't have to be specific to Accumulo for the implementation. So the like the indexing concepts or how you get stuff out of a table, those are all things that you should think about regardless of which NoSQL store that you're using. You just may have different uh, different feature sets available to you depending upon which application you pick. Um, right. Yeah, so I, I, I just want to um, close this down with saying this this Duralist example for, for me was really um, important in understanding the fundamentals of Cumulo. Right? It, it covers several different areas, everything from iter iterator scanning, uh, cell, level, cell level security, um, through all of these different concepts, it helped round out my understanding and helped me move to the next step with Accumulo. And so I think there's a lot of power in, in, these, uh, in this particular example. Uh, John introduced me to this, I think, in probably 2013, um, and it helped, it helped me uh, to have a better understanding. So one of the things that we, we want to encourage uh, in the community is, one, the introduction of these types of uh, examples to help onboard and continue to build our community. Uh, it, it's incredibly important to make sure that we, uh, we continue to see growth. Um, or even proliferation of existing examples, because as I pointed out, uh, Accumulo won. So just, if, if this is new to some of you, then this would be a, a great example of something that, uh, if helpful, other people might need to know about. Yeah, this is a great jumping off point into to leveraging uh, Accumulo more. Uh, so highly recommend it. Um, uh, it. It's meant a lot to me uh, over the years. So uh, this is a good one. Uh, with that, I think we are, we are done for showing this example and all the power that it has, uh, and we would be open to, to any questions. Sure. Yep. Repeat so, the so, yeah. Repeat the question. Uh, can can we speak to Cloudera's commitment to Accumulo uh, in, uh, in in the near future? Um, so we we hear this question a lot. Um, we're absolutely commi uh, committed to Accumulo uh, going forward. Uh, the plan is that you will see, um, you know, as everybody understands from roadmap perspective, we are uh, driving towards CDP uh, as a uh, as a platform. And um, when that is, uh, when, we're, when we are going through our initial cloud development, we're going to iterate through bringing on components. Uh, Accumulo 1.9 will be one of the components that is, is, is going to be a part of CDP. So look forward to seeing that in the future. I'll, I'll let you tag some of this, but I, I think it really depends on, on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, th thanks, Sean, appreciate it. Uh, uh, so the, the, the question was, um, if I don't need cell level security, uh, should I use HBase or should I use Accumulo? Um, and that really depends on, on what, you're, what you're trying to uh, achieve. There are different reasons for using each. 
Um, so one of, one of the things that you have with the Cumulo, right, is uh, um, a proven scalability uh, up to, you know, uh, when we talk about since 2014, it has had the capability of spanning name nodes. Uh, it's it's um, highly stable and, um, and scalable. Um, you know, some of the things that HBase has, right, is um, it, it, has a, it has a very robust community and it has uh, things like Phoenix for SQL access, right? Um, so there are different aspects to each uh, that kind of drive what you should be leveraging. And so, I mean, depending on your use case, if there's an existing application sitting on top of something, that might help drive it. Like you said, scalability, um, uh, you, you may have, you may not want to have to declare your columns up front. Like there, there are all sorts of different characters. There, there are certainly um, there are certainly other uh, other differences, right? Like uh, ingest capability, uh, schema flexibility, uh, and and other aspects that uh, can help drive that as well. And it really depends on your use case. So it, it just can really depend yeah, upon what it is you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else? All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for your time. Really do appreciate it. Um, and we'll be available for any other questions after. Thank you. Thanks.